like you do. Happy Sunday, everybody, and welcome to our uh, live chat that we do every third Sunday of the month, coming to you from the boonies of North Georgia in the USA. Uh, nobody Sunday, in the Georgia next to, to Russia our, ever uh, spoke with an accent like this. So um, today we're going to be um, concentrating on uh, how to guide the eye, what we do what we can do, things that we do. Well, in fact, whatever we do on a canvas is going to guide the eye. It's a matter of how we guide the eye that's going to uh, keep the viewer involved or bore the viewer or communicate to the viewer. And so we're going to um, kind of look at the best ways we can do that. Now, uh, just as an introduction, uh, Welcome to all the Studio Insiders, those are the ones who are channel members. Um, and also welcome to channel subscribers. There's a difference. If you're a subscriber, you can subscribe free. Uh, that means that if you subscribe and, and hit the notification button, every time we post a new uh, quick tip or any kind of video, you get a, you get a notification in your email. Um, and um, you can make comments uh, underneath, as you can in all YouTube videos. Uh, and most likely I will answer your comment underneath the, um, the quick tips. But for this live chat, um, we have this little requirement that you need to be a studio insider to ask questions. And maybe we're being a little bit, um, well, let's just say it like this. Studio insiders can join for what is it, nearly $5 a month. But not only do you get to ask questions during the live chat, you also get at the beginning, or the first Sunday of every month, you get a code for a free video lesson from our website. Um, and then on the second Sunday of each month, you get a free snippet from one of those lessons. And then on the third Sunday, we always have this live chat, which is always subject-centered. And you can ask questions, uh, and I will answer your questions if I can. So that's the way it goes. That's our plan. That's how it works. Um, so get ready with your questions. And I see that we have some folks coming on and saying hello, and hello to all of you, Marie, Joni, Laura, and everybody else. Uh, so let's... let's um, take a look now at uh, what it means to guide the eye. I have a little um, short intro video I've created for you that tells you or guides you through guiding the eye. So this ends up being about 15 minutes long, I think. Uh, if, uh, if, if while watching the video, if you have questions, go ahead and type those in the live in the chat in the chat box. What is that thing? That thing's called chat box, isn't it? Yeah. Go ahead and type your question. Um, we will answer the questions afterwards. Um, so, are you ready, Roger? All right. Here we go. Every mark we make on our canvases, every image we place, whatever we do there. In the long run, those things are guiding the viewer's eye. Here we have a simple scene of cows in a pasture, but let's look at just a few things in there that are causing our eyes to scan that particular photo. We have this cow in front who is uh, closer to us than these cows, and no doubt this is what we notice first. Why do we notice it? Well, we can see that this is so much different than the area surrounding it. The colors are different. Uh, the size is different. The, the cow, because it's closer to us, is larger than these cows. And then let's look at uh, which way our eye is going. We can see here that the curve of this cow is causing a visual movement in this direction. 
the alignment of these cows are calling, causing a visual movement in this direction. The same thing with the alignment of the foliage back here, especially the alignment of the foliage in the far distance with its strong value contrast against the sky, and also the alignment of the clouds. So a number of things are going on there uh, that are really guiding the direction in which our eyes are moving throughout this piece. When we take the cows away, you see that we don't have that a guiding movement. We don't have that contrasting, uh, those contrasting shapes that influence our, the movement, the visual movement. And now our eyes are pretty much just moving back and forth in kind of in a horizontal direction. Now notice what your eyes doing as I put back in just this one cow. Uh, now let's play with that cow just a little bit and show you. I want you to pay attention to what your eyes are doing. See now that simply by reversing that cow and having the cow turn in this direction, your eye actually moves in that direction. And so we don't, we're not noticing this stuff over here so much. In fact, what's really happening there, the eyes sort of moving in this direction. You see that's sort of a C shape. We use that term C, a C shape or a U shape to define a particular kind of visual movement that curves. And you can see now the eye is just curving right out of the picture. We don't have anything over here to want to make our eyes want to go over here. Or right, now we've turned the cow uh, back in, the, in that uh, original direction and we can notice now our eyes seem to do this. They're curving back into the picture, but there's really nothing over here to make our eyes stay there very long. Well, let's play around with that cow just a little bit. And let's observe how just the size of the cow will affect what our eyes are doing. Now, uh, that brings the cow closer to us by making it larger. And now we see that we're even more greatly influenced by this particular visual movement the C curve that moves right around the cow's neck and moves right in this direction right here. We still don't have anything over here very interesting, but by the fact that we enlarged the cow, you might say we made this more about the cow, uh, we, we don't feel as much need for something over here as we did. Well, let's take that a little bit further. Just for fun, let's make the cow even closer to us. And we, now we pull the cow so close to us that we have an overlap back here. We ha have the whole the cow's body overlapping this whole space in here. Um, and uh, if we pull it over like this, I want you to notice the image of the cow is pulling our eye closer to the edge. We're feeling that tension. You see, the closer I pull it to the edge, the more tension we feel of the cow against the edge. That, too, is visual movement. And you can see now all this area in here is feeling really empty. All this area in here, feeling the need for something else. We still have the visual movement here, but we have, we're feeling a need for something to happen over here. L let's just leave that cow where she is, and let's introduce now a second cow. Now, I want you to watch... When I throw this second cow in, I want you to watch what your eye does. Just watch your eye here. Did your eye not jump between this cow and this cow? Now we have the feeling this cow's further away, and we can play with it just a little bit. I want you to watch the visual movement. First of all, before I do that, this cow is turned in this direction with the head slightly tilted down in this way. So that is pulling us inside the frame of the picture of the whole all whole piece. This cow's turn in this direction is allowing our eye to turn in this direction. So they are now having a visual conversation with each other. We have a movement in this direction and a movement in this direction. Now let's play with that just a little bit more and watch what happens. So just watch your eye. Watch what your eye do does 
I'm just going to move in here and let's play with it together. I'm going to bring this cow, I'm going to make this cow larger and bring it a little closer. And I want you to watch how your attention is beginning to compete between these two. Let's bring it really, really close. And I'll pull it down just a little bit like this. Now we have them, we can have them equal size. Here we go. A little bit smaller than that, right? Something like that. All right, now look. Are you having trouble knowing which one to focus on? Is it about both cows now? Watch what's happening with the movement. We still have this movement going around like this. Now we have a much stronger movement going in this direction. We might say it's going in two directions, sort of like this. And now the attention is being pulled right here. But because we only have the two cows... Uh, and then we have them pretty much the same size. You see, now there is almost a competition uh, between their visual movements. Let's change that again. Now, I want you to watch your visual response as I change this. I'm going to pull this back, make it smaller, make it smaller. Now, you do you see now how, because of the strong uh, visual movement we have here, can you see now how, the, in, the, in, in the movement that we have here, can you see now how your eye does this? It kind of moves in this direction right here, and then it goes over here. I'm going to create a different tension. I'm going to keep this one the same size now. I'm going to pull it even closer. Now we have a visual movement that is pretty much concentrated in one area of the piece, but we don't have the visual movement over here. This space now feels empty. So let's see now what would happen if we sort of uh, uh, rearrange the placement of both of these cows. Look what happens to the visual movement when I pull this cow on this side. Now do you see what's happening? Now the visual movement of this cow is doing something like this. And the visual movement of this cow is doing something a little bit different. It's going more like this, in this direction. And we have a little bit more space over here, but because the, this one is headed more in this direction, do we feel a need for a third cow right here? Or do we feel a need maybe uh, to make this cow come, come further over to the edge? Let's... See what, what would happen if we did that. Watch what happens. I'm just going to gradually move it. Gradually move. Now, I want you to notice what your eye does as I pull that cow further over to the other side. Notice how your eye begins to feel a different sense of movement. I'm going to pull the cow way over and maybe almost too far over like that. Now do you see what's going on? We have a space here uh, that seems to be kind of a division between the movement. This, this movement is going in this direction and this movement is going in this direction. So we might say the eye goes here and then there's a sort of a competing movement goes there. I want you to notice that the closer we get an image to the edge of a painting, the stronger that tension, the stronger the movement. So we sort of feel we might be able to make an interesting composition out of that on the one hand. On the other hand, we might feel that there's just maybe a little bit of more conflict there. Uh, there are artists who would make a beautiful composition out of, this, out of this one simply because we have a movement here and a counter movement there. Now in your uh, snippet that you were sent last Sunday. Uh, we talked about the counter movement. That too is visual movement and it can be done uh, very strategically and make very interesting paintings. See what happens now if we turn this cow in the other direction. Now look at what you've got. A totally different uh, feeling or a totally different message in fact. Totally different composition where we can see now 
the directional movement, the visual movement, the, eye, the way the eye is moving, how we are guiding the eye as artists. We still have this. We still have this sort of uh, C movement in this direction. But now we have a change in direction here. So now we have this one moving in this way, this one moving in this way. Um, okay, let's play just a little bit more. Let's play with pushing this cow back and kind of changing the spatial relationship. Space meaning as it's moved, as this cow would be moving into distance in an aerial perspective type distance. All right, now I'm going to be moving it around. Just I'm still going to keep this one curved in this direction, but I'm going to move this one around just a little. Now watch what happens to your eye. As I move it closer in, your eye is attracted again by this movement, but it's the the tension is getting closer because this is moving this way. This is it's almost it's becoming almost a repeated awe uh, movement that way. We have emptiness over here, so part of our uh, intention uh, when we're set, when we're developing a composition should be to keep the eye within the painting itself. And so the way we arrange our images and the way we have them turn, whether towards each other, away from each other, closer to the edge, closer to the center, all those things will affect how the viewer's eye is going to move throughout the painting. Now you can see what happens when I switch the cow on the left here. I, I, I flipped it and now we have a different movement. We have a movement that's moving more in this direction towards the interior of the piece. And now this one is moving more in this direction right here. And we have empty space over here. Now, I'm going to do one more little uh, rearrangement there and show you how we might set these two cows up. I know people will often say, you need an unequal number of images. Well, I've seen Andrew Wyeth and, and other artists, master artists, use just even numbers of images to make them work. It's not so much the number of images as to how you arrange them uh, and how you, um, what kind of a relationship we put between them in order to keep the eye interested in the whole piece. So let's play with this this one. Let's keep this one right here, close enough to the edge there uh, to create interest, but it's the way the cow is turned is bringing the eye right around in this direction. Now watch what happens to your eye. The movement between this cow and this cow, visual movement, Watch what happens as I shift it around. If I well, it wouldn't make sense to bring it down because then I would need to bring it, make it larger. Well, let's do that. Let's make it a little bit larger, and let's bring it down. Bring it a little bit closer to us. An image like that. We have two images together. There's a size relationship. The closer or the larger the image, the closer we feel that image to be to us. Uh, the smaller the image, the further away we feel that image. So uh, that would probably put this one, that size would probably put this one about right in here. Now if we placed it about right here and maybe change the size just a little bit more for a little bit further back, that begins to create a little bit more interest. Perhaps now you can feel the visual movement in this direction, this direction, that the eye is now flowing more throughout the whole piece. Now we could continue to play with those and rearrange them and flip them around and add more cows, but this whole exercise is just to drive home to you that how the kinds of images you use, the way you turn them, uh, the way you call attention to them, are they uh, isolated, as both of these are because they're so different from the space, are they isolated in space, Value contrast is calling our attention to whatever's going on in there too. Uh, but what, however you're calling attention to the image, how you arrange those images is going to determine how you guide the viewer's eye throughout the piece. All right, now it's time for your questions.
Okay, now it's your turn to ask questions. All right, while I'm waiting for your questions to come in, um, I see we had some other folks to join us during the video. Welcome. Um, think about the things that, well, first of all, think about, think about the whole thing, uh, what we do in the arts. That um, the arts, we, we humans have receptors that, we, that the arts respond to. Um, music responds to our ears, so our ears are receptors for music. And so uh, someone who's composing or someone who's playing music is guiding the ear. And whatever they do there is guiding the ear, and our receptors are receiving that, and we respond to that. And, um, and then, of course, the same, in the same way, we as visual artists, we, re we are um, communicating to the eyes. And the eyes, uh, the sense of the eyes, are receiving that communication and responding through all of our other senses to the eyes. So uh, that really is what's going on when we're guiding the eye. Whatever we're putting down on that canvas is going to guide the eye. But how we guide the eye is going to determine uh, how it's received. Okay, Laura's asking, how much do you adhere to perspective in relation to size? Do you push it? Uh, I push it only to the point that it will make visual sense. And this is me personally. Now, if I, were, if I were painting in a surrealistic mode, like Salvador Dali, for example, Salvador Dali would use the manipulation of, of size in perspective in order to uh, communicate the surrealism, the, uh, the super realism, something that we wouldn't, that we might see in our dreams that we we wouldn't expect to see in reality unless we're on something high. If we're high on something, we might see it in reality. But um, so I think in order to communicate, uh, in order not to distort our communication, uh, or let me say as a as as an artist myself, in order not to distort my communication, not re distort what you as viewer is going to receive. I uh, don't push it too much. Only push it to a point that uh, might um, might make sense in, in some visual way. Um, so I hope I answered that, Laura. Bridget says, are you saying it's better not to have something facing or moving out of the frame without having a counter movement to pull your eye back in? Yes, I am saying that. Um, you don't want the ears, you don't want the viewer's eye to just go out of the frame and stay out of the frame. Uh, so I'm saying that we find ways, and it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that you don't have something at the edge of the frame that might be moving in a direction that it would pull the viewer's eye out. That is a very, uh, that is an exciting, or uh, maybe a creative way to work with, with visual movement, which we are working with when we're guiding the eye. But we need something over on the other side to pull the eye back in. So you might, you might say the eye might move out and circle around, come back in in some way. Um, the more standard and more classic ways of guiding the eye will have the images inside the frame, one turn in one direction, maybe one turn in another direction, or somehow countering one another inside the frame. But uh, I've seen some, like Andrew Wyeth, I keep referring back to Andrew Wyeth, but uh, there is an awful communication about a wonderful painting of where Carl and Anna are in this scene together, Carl is facing outside the frame and he has a rifle in his arm that's pointed sort of towards Anna, who is inside the frame looking at Carl. So you have that strong visual movement of, of his, which leads us out back in through the gun and into Anna. So uh, that's one, the, I don't know, that image always comes to my mind because I think even though it's an awful thing to have communicated to us, awful message to receive, it's never the way, a very clever way of guiding the viewer's eye in order to drive home a point. 
Okay, uh, Mary Ellen says, I have trouble figuring out how to guide the eye in non-objective painting. Your thoughts on this? Well, in non-objective painting, the other thing that's missing is re are uh, recognizable images. So we're, you're dealing with the same you're, de you're dealing with the same visual elements. You're dealing with visual movement. And I think if you uh, um, uh, think about what causes visual movement, the kinds of things that cause visual movement. All right, now for one thing, a value contrast. The stronger the value, well, well, in order, in order there for there to be visual mu movement, there's got to be a strong attraction for the eye, something that strongly attracts the eye. So uh, value contrast, a value contrast, the stronger the contrast, the more tra attractive it is to the eye. So if you have a value contrast that somehow is moving in a direction, you have movement that you're working with, always working with movement, visual movement. But if you have value contrast, it's moving in one direction. Could be vertical, could be horizontal, could be diagonal, could be in a curve. But you have value, con something that's contrasted, colors contrasted, values contrasted, with the strong value contrast. Color could be doing about anything. But anyway, if you've got a strong value contrast moving this way, to keep the eye in the painting, you would want another value contrast somewhere else that is countering it or uh, dealing with it. Now, value contrast is only one thing. You have gradation. Gradation helps create movement. Now, gradation could be value gradation where you have dark moving to light. Now, you'll no notice that your eye will move with a gradation. Your eye will move, say, we use gradations uh, in when we're working with images, to define roundness, your eye moves around something because of the gradation. If you don't use your gradation, the gradation there, the eye is going to stop. It's going to seem flat. But so if you might be gradating from dark to light, say top to bottom, that that is a way of of, of uh, leading the eye. And then you might have another dark at the top gradating down, which would bring the eye in. You can gradate with texture. A, heavy, a strong texture, uh, or you say uh, uh, strong texture that would gradate into more subtle texture, that's another way of gradating. You can gradate almost all the visual elements. So value contrast, gradation, um, those are ways. Uh, the way images are faced, uh, if you have a shape that is a shape that is moving vertical, the eye is going to move vertical with it. So you pull the eye back by using a horizontal, or if you have a shape, uh, uh, and that too is movement. So shapes create movement. Well, we, you get, the, get where I'm going here, um, Mary Ellen, that you're working with visual elements only as your subject matter when you're doing non-objective painting. And so you treat those visual elements the same way in, uh, in realistic or objective painting as we treat them in non-objective painting. Um, Johnny says, uh, just a comment, but the video certainly illustrates why you should not just paint what's before you in plain air or photo reference. Yes, indeed. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, w when people are just uh, painting directly from a photo reference, or even if you just go set up in plain air, you set up, you see a scene, and you paint it without thinking about uh, without giving consideration, no, not thinking about without giving consideration to what it's doing, how it's guiding the eye of the viewer, you miss out on an opportunity because we have images all around us. It's better to evaluate, evaluate your image, your subject, your reference. First of all, evaluate what's in that photo or evaluate what's in, in front of you in plain air or still life or even if you're doing figurative painting. Evaluate what's there in terms of how, uh, what its elements are doing, what's, what are the shapes doing, what are the values doing, uh, what, what are the textures doing, what are these things doing? Because it's the way you arrange these things in your, on your painting surface that's going to determine how the, eye, how the, the, the viewer's eye receives them. Not only that, it, it determines how you express it 
which I, sometimes I think maybe I might not be stressing enough, but how you're expressing it determines how the viewer is going to receive it. So uh, aligning these things, how we align these things and how we uh, uh, arrange them is, is going to mean everything in that respect. Um, okay, I've got a bunch of, thank, bunch of thank yous there. Shall I take a bow? <laughs> um, okay, Mary Ellen says, um, I have trouble... Oh, no, I already saw that. I already did that one, didn't I? Okay. Um, okay. Jenny. Who? Joni. Where? I just read that one. Oh, yeah. I, I just, yeah, I just responded to Joni's. Yeah. What's that? Okay, got another one coming up. Oh, gosh, I hope I hadn't thoroughly answered the questions. I hope I've left something unanswered so that you can ask your questions. Uh, I'm surprised I haven't received any color questions uh, about arranging what color does uh, for guiding the eye. Because uh, color is, uh, uh, okay, here's Laura again. Can you speak about tone and guiding the eye versus tonal balance? Okay, uh, yes, um, tonal balance. We're talking about tone. When, we, when we're talking about tone, we're talking about value. Val tone is a word we use. Uh, to to you to discuss value value tone uh, and so on so uh, we respond to the tone in realistic painting according to how the lights and shadows are falling and we we respond with a balance of not having an equal amount of light and shadow we would have uh, and, and this all works together so we. Uh, choose in a context within our the uh, whatever reference we're looking at that either is predominantly in shadow or predominantly not in shadow. That begins the balance, and then when we, what we do with that, how we arrange images within that, where we stress the value contrast, where it's the strongest, where we uh, don't stress the value contrast, which. Uh, the eye will, will will transition through. Um, it all works together. So the we while we are guiding the eye, we are also creating balance and tonal balance is one of those balances we're creating. Now we can't think about everything at once, but we build these skills one at a time. We don't try to build all the skills at one time. That's just overwhelming. But we build the skills one at, one at a time. So we build the skill of, of tonal awareness, of uh, um, building tonal balance. And, with, and then with, within that, then we, f keeping our tonal balance, we build the skill of guiding the eye within that. So there's not a versus there. They work together, uh, one supporting the other. And that's the way many things uh, of, the, of the, the composing process for painting, that's the way many things work. This way everything works, in fact. Uh, everything is support, every, uh, everything we do is supporting everything else. And so we train ourselves by focusing on building the principles one, one thing at a time, a lot of this is intuitive. A lot of what we do is intuitive. Uh, but one way to check the intuition is to understand the principles and then we can fine tune our intuition. Uh, Bridget says, you mentioned the C shape in the video. Uh, is it useful to try to make a movement shape when planning your composition? What if there's an element you won't include that doesn't fit that shape. Well, it's better to find it than it is to try to superimpose it. Uh, usually, um, many times, when, when you are analyzing a, a reference that you might be considering for a painting, you might find in there, you might find that the way the, the light and the shadow are working together, you might find an actual C movement, or you might find an L movement, now, usually we, we refer to the C movement as C, reverse C, U, and the reverse U. It's the same movement, just turned in a different direction. 
But there's also the triangular movement, uh, how maybe images three emphasis, diff degrees of emphasis or range are going to kind of create a triangular movement. There's also the L movement where where the, uh, uh, the way the outside of uh, maybe a shadow areas, shadow areas or light areas are arranged, they flow into kind of an L movement. And then there's that internal space inside the L. All those are balance, are for balance, balancing movement. So I think it's a better idea to discover it. And then if something, yes, and one of the ways to make things uh, interesting in entertainment is to create, if you have a, uh, a basic movement that things are moving in, for example, when I had the cow there and the way the cow is turned is creating that kind of C shape, that C movement. It's interesting then if there are things that don't fall within them, put them in there for, for uh, dialogue, for, for emphasis, for uh, uh, entertainment, you might say, or for a way to make it more interesting or to have a little something, a side note to say it about the painting itself. So if you'll, if you'll study artists, uh, especially uh, master artists in our history, you'll see them using all kinds of things that are a part of the whole scene, but where maybe the major movement is doing one thing, but there might be a little side movement that might be doing something a little different. It's the amount of emphasis that puts on it, but that you put on it, um, that you pay attention to. I hope I didn't make that too contorted. Joni, as to color, I haven't done as much monochrome painting, but those kinds of paintings with just a hint of color really get your attention. Uh, one thing you mentioned in the last workshop, how you change one element. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. One thing you mentioned in the last workshop was how if you change one element, it affects everything else. Could you talk about that? Okay, wait a minute, Monica. Yeah, yes, it does. <laughs> um, how it's because of what's because of how the how the eye responds. That's what we always go back to. Uh, what is the eye doing? What how is the eye behaving? And so if you have whatever you do in your painting affects everything else. So if you go back to the little intro video I was doing here, did you notice uh, when say for example when I I had that cow on on the left hand side and was turned in this direction. When I put that other cow over there and changed it, did you notice how it changed the whole thing? It changed how the whole thing communicates. So uh, it's 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 sort of like let me go back to music again. If you think about music, you have uh, just if you simplify if you simplify the whole thing about music, you might have a melody. And just that melody by itself. But then when you add a chord to that melody, it changes the character of the melody. It's something you notice. It's something you might not be able to put into words, but you notice. And then if you take, if you have a, a one chord that's underneath a portion of the melody and the chord changes to a different chord underneath another portion of the melody, it changes the character of the melody. Then you can further change the character of the melody by switching from major chords to minor chords. So um, the idea is to notice these things. Notice that when you put anything, any change, like if you throw a, if you're, if you're working on, on a painting and you throw a really high in, high, high, a highly saturated color in, Notice what how it affects everything else. How do you respond? When we say affects, we mean how the eye is receiving it. How did it change it in your... Did, did it mean that your eye went there first? And is that the way it changed it? Or did it mean that it created a different kind of movement? Did it mean... Sometimes that can happen. Say if you have, if you have a triangular movement going on in a painting and you put something else here that has an equal contrast or, or maybe is a is a contrasting color like an orange the red orange cows in a green in a yellow green pasture if, you, if I were to throw a, th a fourth cow in there it changes the movement the movement starts moving in this direction so that's why you need that's why um, that's what I mean by that 
that the things will change that the way the eye responds when the eye responds in a different kind of configuration then the thing changes and that's just an introduction to how to think about that uh krister are viewers aren't viewers of a painting affected by different ways depending on the viewer's interest in the objects in the painting maybe a stupid question but it's not a stupid question yes yes that is that is true. We do ha have our uh, personal preferences and things we're interested in. And so it's highly possible that your interest in a particular subject might pull you to a painting just because of the subject uh, itself. Uh, but it doesn't mean it may, it may not all, always be true. I mean, there it could be that there's something you're not interested in at all, a subject you're not interested in at all, and maybe you walk into somebody's home and there's a painting <clears throat> hanging there that is of something you have no interest in. Say, uh, say if, if you just say, I have no interest in barns. No interest in barns. Barns bore me. I've heard that. Barns are cliche. Barns bore me. And you walk into somebody's house and there's a painting of a barn that is in such a uh, contrasting light, it calls your attention to it. And you can't help but look at it. The fact that it pulled you to it, pulled some interest to it, even though you ha you hate barns, even though you hate looking at bar paintings and barns, that particular one, you might be interested in. I've had that happen when there, there, there are certain things I don't necessarily enjoy looking at. I'm not gonna tell you what they are, but, <laughs> Well, not now at least, but anyway, <clears throat> but I have seen paintings that would have include subjects that I'm not particularly interested in, but I, there was something about the painting, the strength of the painting that pulled me to it and made me interested in what was actually happening in the painting. So it works both ways, but each of us is going to have our biases. We each have our personal biases, and yes, that is not a stupid question. That does play greatly into it. Okay. Uh, oh, Joni gets it. Wonderful. I love it when the light bulbs go on. So I wish I could see the light bulbs. Every time I answer a question here, I wish the little light bulbs would just pop up on the screen. But I guess the technology won't allow that to happen yet. So, um, okay. And um, you hinted about color. Okay, Joni, again. You hinted uh, about color and movement. I'd be interested to know more about that. Yes, okay. Uh, Bridge said, go, uh, go on, tell us what you don't like looking at. No, I won't do that right now. <laughs> but it, it's bound to come out sooner or later. So just stay tuned. Joni, yes, think about this. Um, color. Um, something that you were talking about, colors that are neutral, are paintings that are done in very neutralized tones and how there might be areas in those neutralized tones that are a little more saturated in color and how the eye tends to go to those. The, uh, what happens with color? What you do with color is also going to affect the way the eye moves within, within a subject. Now, let, I'm gonna go, since, since I want to, uh, to uh, uh, th want you to think about in your visualization, go back to my, the cows again. If those cows had been black rather than orange, because uh, because the surroundings, pretty much the surroundings in that scene, the surroundings are predominantly in the yellow green hues, somewhat neutralized, not very much, but neutralized as we see them in nature to the point that we're seeing them in nature. And we didn't have some blue sky there. But the, 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 the sky is leaning more towards a uh, greenish blue, so it does harmonize with the yellow green that we see in that pasture. Now, so the red orange that of those cows, the color of the red orange to orange range that made up the, the, make up those cows is in the complementary range of yellow green. Now I just happen to have right here my little um, color wheel that also is uh, intensity wheel. So we can see here, right here, uh, the yellow green, yellow green is in this area right here, right across from red violet, 
and we see that the the red and red orange are um, analogous colors to red violet. So we have a really warm red orange against yellow green, which is cooler. So uh, what's happening there is because that yellow, that red orange is warmer, our eyes are going to it against yellow green. Now, if those cows were black, if they had been done in black, we would have value contrast there, but imagine it. Our eyes would go to it in a different way. Our eyes would be entertained with it in a different way. So hue, uh, if you're using a hue that is warm within a hues that are cool, we're, the eyes are gonna notice that hue more. If I'm using like here, what? The, the green yeah. on the color wheel is transparent. <laughs> oh! <laughs> well, well that's odd. That. You, uh, all right, we've got a green screen, so you couldn't see the green. <laughs> was that what's going on? Yeah. You couldn't see the green? Yeah. Oh, that didn't work, did it? Well, anyway, okay, you had a little fun there. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, now analogous colors, because they are uh, akin to each other, uh, the eye is going to transition one through another. So using analogous, analogous hues is a good way to, to let the eye flow or lead the eye. You could guide the eye through an analogous hues where the eye transitions through analogous hue. Or uh, you could use, uh, if you were using um, uh, the complementary hues, you might have the analogous hues there, like say the yellow greens, which I'm not gonna put that up anymore because I don't want it to have holes in it. Uh, the, any of the greens, if you have the reds within the greens, then the reds are going to get the attention. Now, uh, likewise, likewise, if you have more neutralized, if the yellow green, for example, is more of an olivey green, it's very, very more neutralized, very, very much neutralized. But then the red orange is neutralized too. They're going to be quieter together. Why is that? Because they've got included in them some of the same colors. The red has the green in it, or it wouldn't be neutralized. The green has the red in it, or it wouldn't be neutralized. So the colors that are more uh, or less saturated meaning they have some of their complement in them, the more, the less, the more neutralized they are, the less they emphasize each other. Therefore, um, the eye's gonna transition through those. They're gonna feel more like they belong. Whereas if in a neutralized area, you have a more saturated color in the middle of that neutralized area, because it has less of that neutral in it, of that complement in it, the eye's gonna notice it. So you can, do, you can do those experiments, you can go look anywhere uh, and compare the colors or look at the colors analytically. Uh, look at the colors, what they're doing to each other according to how neutralized they are, how saturated they are, uh, their difference in values. I didn't mention that, but we have the difference in hues, are they analogous or are they opposite in hues, their difference in saturations and their difference in values. So all those things play together. I hope I didn't make too much out of that one, but anyway. Okay, uh, Lynn, do the shapes like the O or the L or the S or triangular shapes give different feelings? If so, what feelings would you say they lean towards? Yes, they, well, they're bound to give different feelings. And I don't know, I think maybe what you might, uh, I don't know that I can say what feelings they lean to. There's so many kinds of feelings. But if you think about what we feel by curve, we feel a smoother feeling by something that curves than we do something that's abrupt. So you might say a feeling would be smooth or abrupt. So a more circular or an S movement, is perhaps more serene or more flowing, whereas maybe the triangular movement, more precise or um, more, um, exact, uh, abrupt maybe, uh, abrupt maybe depending upon, uh, depending upon the arrangement itself. Uh, so I think associating kinds of movement, O, C's, S's, 
triangles, di vertical, horizontal. We think vertical as being straight, uh, um, secure, horizontal as being restful, but it's not li necessarily limited to that. So if you think about uh, what evokes in you uh, when you feel that kind of movement, you can just make your hand, if you just have your hand make that movement feel what it feels to you as opposed to that that kind of movement. So uh, that's about the best thing to do that, Lynn. Okay, Mary's art. I thought it was some fancy, oh, I thought it was some fancy new color wheel. Yeah, it is. It's called transparent when there's a green screen. <laughs> okay, Joni. Cool, never thought of analogous making the graduated movie. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, color does lead us. It leads us. Uh, all right, John, I've said enough about that. Oh, I see a light bulb, yay! <laughs> Mary Ellen found a light bulb. Yeah, Mary Ellen, share it with your friends. <laughs> I love the light bulb, wonderful. I mean, I gave a light bulb moment of hope, right? <laughs> I hope so, yeah. So, you know, the fascinating thing, I, said, I, I may be repeating myself, but to me, the fascinating thing about, about painting is that we have so many, so many wonderful things to work with that we can never ever fully master. Uh, the things we're talking about today, the visual movement, how we guide the eye, the different ways we can guide the eye, the different ways that we can entertain the eye, the little tricks we can pull. There, you know, sometimes there. Uh, Oh, I can't remember who it is right now, but anyway, I pull this myself sometimes. Sometimes, like if you, you might just uh, if you have a painting uh, that where everything is really, really serene, and you'd like to kind of uh, give everybody a jar, you might throw a a, a a complimentary color, a little bit of a complimentary color. You might just sling some with your paintbrush. Let it land somewhere just to give a little jolt in the painting that you might not notice until you say, what's that doing there? I know, that's, that's a little bit off the... But uh, I think Richard Schmidt did that sometimes. You know, he would just sort of put something there for fun. Uh, as long as everything else makes sense, uh, we can do pull these little things and, uh, and actually get away with them. All right, I, have you run out of questions? Here we go. Lynn, thank you very much. You're quite welcome. It's always a pleasure. Um, so I'm sitting here waiting for another question. Roger, what? Let's look at your photos. Hmm? Your photos. What about pictures. them? Oh, you should if you had anything. pick up something and use it for a, a stimulus for, for an answer for a question that hasn't been asked yet? <laughs> um, let me see. I'm going through going through the the kinds of things that cause visual movement. If you think about it, I talked about color, uh, and, and that's just you know that's just to get you started thinking about color. But what about textures? Uh, textures will also attract attention. Um, if you say it, um, things that are have lots and lots and lots of movement in them are are textures, and um, I'm thinking about uh, a, uh, you know, a, a bunch, a pile of brush. If you have a pile of brush that has all this textural stuff in it, and because it has all this textural stuff, textures are caused by thousands of little value contrasts. Think about it. Thousands of little value contrasts. We wouldn't see it as textures if, it, if the value contrast weren't there. And, and so the, the stronger the texture, the bit busier the texture, uh, the more value contrast do you have there of, of dozens and dozens of shapes that are just moving in all directions. And the more directions they're moving and more texture you got, and the eyes are going to go there, and that's going to influence the visual movement. Now, if you think about how textures move into the distance, uh, it visualize, I'll take get, get away from the, the field thing again, uh, but visualize in, in the, uh, uh, a field that's grown up, a field, a field of uh, grass where the grass is really, really tall. And if you're close to it, 
you're going to see lots and lots of textural textures of the grass all those little valley contrasts going in all those different directions and then if you look just slightly beyond that you don't see them quite as clearly if you'll notice what's really happening there the value of contrast has decreased. It's not quite as contrasted as it was. And then you look slightly above that same thing. If you look way above it in a very distant field, you won't see any value of contrast at all. You see, oh, you see just a little bit maybe of, uh, of differences in value between those colors of grass. That is going to lead us like that. Visual movement there is from the more highly textured to the less textured. So how more highly textured attracts the eye. Think about gardens. Oh, that's a good one. That regard uh, regarding lines. Yes, uh, um, lines. Uh, well, you know, if I had to, if I were to name, uh, let's play a little game. Let's play a little game. Think about what a shape needs in order for you to see it. What does a shape need in order for you to see it? Now just think about that. Uh, say I could hold up, uh, welcome, to, okay. I could hold up this cup, for example. All right, now, what could I take away from this cup and you still know it's a cup? Not the kind of cup, it, uh, mug, whatever. Not the kind it is, not that, the fact that it's a mug. What can I take away? I could take away the color, and you still know it's a mug, right? Uh, could I take away the shape, and you still know it's a mug? No. What creates the shape? The edges, the lines. That's what, what I was calling with lines. The lines of, these are lines that are creating the edges. That's not the only kind of line, but those are lines that create the edges. So that's, uh, I can take away everything but the shape. The shape is made up of lines. Shape and line are visual elements. What else could I take away? I could not take away the value. If I take away the value, you can't see it. And I'm not just value. Value, contrast. Uh, you, can't, you can't have just one value. Think about it. If you just have white, you see nothing. If you just have black, you see nothing. If you just have gray, you see nothing. you got to have two values in order to see anything. The degree to which those two values are contrasted is the degree to which you're going to, your eye is going to go to it. So, without shape, value, and sh we say without shape and value, you see nothing. Without line, you see no shape. So shape, value, and line, those are absolutely necessary for creating, uh, or for, any, for, any, for any image to be seen. The other things just help describe the image. The color helps describe the image. The texture helps describe the image. The shape, the line, help create the direction of the movement, the way your eye moves over that image. So I don't know how I got off on that one, but I just thought, I guess maybe it was that. Did you uh, get Bridget's? Hmm? Did you get Bridget's? Have you any tips for seeing how your painting is working when you're sick of working on it? <laughs> um, yeah, when you're sick of working on it, it's the wrong time for you to be looking at how it's working. I think my biggest tip is turn it to the wall and don't look at it for a while. And I'm being serious there. It says we do reach that point. If you're working on a painting and you're, and you're sick of it, it's time for you to turn it to the wall and not look at it. And I'm thinking not look at it for quite a while, at least a day, two days, a week. Because a lot of times you might think you have something really horrible that's not working at all. And if you'll turn it to the wall or you hide it from yourself and don't allow yourself to even look at it for at least a week and you come back and look at it with fresh eyes, you might be able to see something you didn't see before. That's my biggest tip for uh, paintings that you're sick of looking at. Uh, and I'm looking at my watch right now, and I'm seeing that we're almost out of time. Now, let's see. Claire, um, what about gardens? Blah, blah, blah. Lovely curving lines feel more peaceful. Yes. Formal gardens with square and straight lines feel tighter. Yes. Good point. Good point. That's the kind of observation we artists make. Those are the kinds of things that we use when we're communicating. 
uh, when we're communicating through our paintings. All those things together be interesting as a shape. What would be interesting as a shape, Johnny? Um, I missed something somewhere. Got a new member. Garland. Got a new member. Garland. Garland, welcome. Welcome. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, we love our Studio Insider members, and we would love for those of you who are not Studio Insiders to join. Join our little club. Be a part of all the exciting things that happen. Get those free video lessons every month. Be surprised. You might really learn something. So uh, the clock is telling me it is over. <laughs> this is the end of our chat session. So thank you all for watching. Uh, and we'll look forward to our chat again on the third in the third Sunday of, what is next month? June, right? Yeah. Yeah, the third Sunday of June. We'll see you again, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. And meanwhile, we'll be in touch. So bye-bye for now.